Good morning, church. I am super excited about our Missions Emphasis Month, our theme this year, All In. Our heart is global with our Kingdom Builders focus, all leading up to November 17th, which is Miracle Offering. How many of you are excited about Miracle Offering? Yeah, you should be. I love Miracle Offering Sunday. I love the faith that just grows in and then through Miracle Offering Sunday. You know, just a, just a quick, maybe short history of Kingdom Builders for those of you who, who are maybe newer with us at C2. In 2018, we started uh, an initiative called Kingdom Builders. And since 2018, we just went over the $1 million mark since its inception. Uh, We did that through Miracle Offering and through the end of 2023. And so I love that we're on to our second $1 million, second million dollars. Isn't that awesome? And so... I'm, maybe we can, just, we can just get that second million this year. Let's just believe for that, right? That would be the miracle as we stretch our faith forward for that second million, all of it going to missions, above and beyond our tithe, expanding what God is doing here and around the world through missions. You know, in, in the five years that we started, uh, since we started Kingdom Builders, over 400 individuals and families uh, have, have become Kingdom Builders. You see, kingdom builders is not a what, it's a who. If you give above and beyond your tithe into kingdom builders, you are a kingdom builder. So it's really about the who, that you've captured God's heart, that you've captured the vision to be a local church with a global heart so his kingdom will come. Each year we pray and we seek God, we ask for his heart to be revealed on what part we will play. Each of us individually or as a family, then collectively as a church. And then we put out our vision book in January. It looks like this is 2024's vision book. You can grab these. The ushers will have these right outside the doors as you leave this morning. If you don't have one, I encourage you to grab one and put it wherever you pray daily and peruse it, look through it, look at the pictures and read the stories because it will inspire you and what part you can play in being a kingdom builder. It lists not only the people we support, but the projects that we're going after to bring God's kingdom around the world. It's above, we we say about kingdom builders that it's above and beyond our tithe. Pastor Ben just talked a little bit about our tithe, how it goes to support the daily and weekly ministry, the ongoing ministry of our local church right here through C2 Church and all of the ministries that happen on a weekly basis. But through Kingdom Builders, we can expand the reach of C2 Church both through local church expansion, but global missions. And we talk about global missions, we're talking about our missionaries in Senegal and in El Salvador, in Bangladesh and in Botswana, all around the world. Do you know C2 has missionaries on every continent except for Antarctica? But maybe God's calling you to Antarctica. I don't know. Maybe we'll be the first to send missionaries to Antarctica. Why not us? Why not C2 Church having the first missionary to Antarctica? Some of you are just like, the Lord is calling me to, the, to be the frozen chosen. <laughs> I believe it this morning. I do believe that God is calling some of, our, uh, of you in this room, within the sound of my voice, whether you're online or in this room, to be missionaries. I believe God has called each of us to his mission, and some specifically. I've been praying that God would raise up through the next generation missionaries that would go all around the world. I'm praying that God would raise up full-time missionaries from our church. We've seen it happen. I I think uh, of Nicole Jones, and I I think of Brianna Johnson, each being called to full-time missions. I love that God is raising up missionaries out of our church. When we talk about kingdom builders, it's about building God's kingdom. It's not just about building buildings, it's about building his kingdom. It's not about the name of C2 Church, it's about the name of Jesus. When we talk about kingdom builders, you might think it's an appeal for money, but really it's an appeal for faith. That this is a moment every year when we talk about kingdoms, we talk about miracle offering, it's about a moment of faith for each one of us to step in that space of what what is known, what is is, um, in our own reality, and then that space of what could be, 
what is possible, and maybe even what is impossible, because God specializes in impossible things. That's what we call a miracle. (laughs) When we do this so that all can hear about the gospel, so we invest in missionaries and ministries all around the world, from right here in Columbia with My Life Clinic and, and Primrose Hill and, and CASA, which is court appointed uh, special advocates for foster care. We invest, it's, I like to refer to it as a missions mutual fund, that as every dollar you invest go, goes to, to wonderful ministries that then multiply through God's grace and through his power, multiply the, the money that we've given. And I love that through kingdom builders, we give meaning to money, right? That's the thing about kingdom builders. It brings meaning to money because money is just an object. And I believe God can take it and cause it to have meaning. And so we diversify our portfolio to to continue with that mission mutual fund idea. And, and we support missionaries and ministries all around the world. We support local church expansion, and we support next-gen leaders. How many of you uh, next-gen uh, uh, students, kids, have gone on a missions trip with the support of a Kingdom Builder scholarship? Would you raise your hand? Raise it up high. Lots of you. I know we've probably done over 40 or 50 scholarships to help students go on a missions trip because a missions trip will change the life and the trajectory of, of a student when they go on a missions trip. And so our heart is global because God's heart is global. We want to reach our neighbors and we want to reach the nations. What I love about Kingdom Builders is it enables us to, ha- to have a reach around the world to places we can't go and let's be honest, places that we won't go. Through Kingdom Builders, our reach is expanded and each of us can play a part in what God is doing around the world, not only in our neighborhoods, but in the nations. Every person, everywhere, every generation, every culture, that they might hear the gospel. Our heart is global because God's heart is global. I think one of the most famous verses that reflects God's heart is John 3.16. Inevitably, when you go to a sporting event, there's some Yahoo holding up a sign that says John 3.16, and some crazy guy just waving around a sign... There we go. There it is. Come on, Michael. Hold it up. Wave it around. There you go. There's some crazy guy with a sign that says John 3, 16. Show, show the picture real quick. Thank you, Michael. Right, right between the goalposts, John 3, 16. One of the most famous stories of John 3, 16 is when uh, Tim Tebow in the, the, uh, the national championship game in, what is it, 2009, the BCS national championship game, Florida Gators against the Oklahoma Sooners. He decided a moment before the game, he, I think he was wearing Philippians 3 something, and he said, I felt like God told me to change it, and so he was praying about it, and then all of a sudden he decided to put John 3, 16, and, and the way he describes it, it was like a couple of minutes before the game, and he slaps him on, and he goes out. And through that game, one of the most uh, uh, watched national championships uh, at that time, the most watched game of all time in that, in that day and age, 2009, 90 million people Googled John 3, 16. Isn't that crazy? That was, that was an amazing thing. 90 million people looked up, what does John 3.16 mean? Many of you sitting in this room probably know what John 3.16 is. You wouldn't have to Google it. But there are people who haven't heard the gospel explained through John 3.16. Three years later, when Tim Tebow was playing in the NFL for the Denver Broncos, he decided to wear those same eye patches with John 3.16 again. This was exactly three years after the national championship game. And after the game, as one reporter put it, says, Tim was approached by the team's public relations representative, Patrick, who said excitedly, Timmy, do you realize what happened? Tim responded, yeah, we just beat the Steelers. We're going to play the Patriots. He says, no, do you realize what happened? Patrick asked again and then said, it's exactly three years later from the day you wore John 3.16 under your eyes. Oh, that's really cool, Tim said. 
No, I don't think you realize what happened. During the game, you threw for 316 yards. Your yards per completion were 31.6. Your yards per rush were 3.16. The ratings for the night were 31.6. And the time of possession was 31 minutes and six seconds. And during the game, 90 million people Googled John 316. It's the number one trending thing on every platform. John 316 is well known. But it's more than just a a clever sign at a sporting event or or a kid's memory verse for Sunday school or, or a cliche Christian Bible lesson. I want us to read together out loud John 316. Would you go ahead and put that up on the screen? You can read it in English or Spanish, whichever you prefer. But let's read it together out loud. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever should not perish, but have e- Good job. Give yourselves a round of applause. This is one of the first scriptures I ever memorized in Spanish. Porque de tal manera amo Dios al mundo que ha dado a su hijo inugenito para que todo aquel que no cree no se pierda mas tenga vida eterna. John 3, 16. I needed, I needed help. You know, if I was in El Salvador, it would have just come easily. <laughs> but here's the thing about John 3, 16 that I want you to capture because in its simplicity, you might miss that the gospel is wrapped up in this one verse. Some have called it the gospel in a nutshell. But the heart of God and the plan of God and the mission of God is revealed through John 3, 16. First of all, John 3, 16, I believe, is God's declaration God's declaration to all of humanity, I love you. Jesus, through this verse, declared, God loves you. God loves the world. That, that, wor- that word in Greek, world, is cosmos, meaning creation, all of creation. Why does God love all creation? Because it reflects him. It was by his divine handiwork that all of creation came to be. And then on day six of creation, his greatest handiwork displayed when he breathed in of his own breath into humanity, Adam and Eve. It's said that there was in that moment a divine spark put into every human being, the eternal soul a connection with the creator that every created human would always have. Romans 1 tells us since the fall of creation, the original sin of Adam and Eve, that all of creation, all the animals, the earth is groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. That all of humanity has felt this brokenness and disconnection since the fall. And they're waiting to, for the, it to be set right, for the righteousness of God's people and the kingdom of God to be revealed. But what John 3, 16 reveals to us is God's love for all of humanity, for all of the nations of the world. God responds to man's rebellion by revealing his love and generosity by giving Jesus. John 3.16 is the revelation of God's unyielding, unrelenting, unending, unchanging, and undeniable love for his creation. I love that John 3.16 is a sign, but it's not just a poster board sign. It's a sign of God's great love for you and for me, for all people of all time, of every nation, If you were to look at John 3, 16 in your Bible, two two verses prior to verse 16, verses 14 and 15 say this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wild, in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You'd have to go back to Exodus to read the story of Moses lifting up the bronze serpent upon a stick. If you've ever seen the, uh, the symbol for 
uh, I think it's for veterinary services. It's a cross with a snake on it. It's born out of the story of, of Moses lifting up the serpent. Because of the people's behavior and rebellion towards God, a curse came upon them and, and uh, poisonous snakes began to bite them. This is a great story. Some of you are like, oh, I hate snakes. And it says that Moses, the predecessor of, of Jesus, right? He's a, he's a, a foreshadowing or a, a figure of, of uh, Jesus before Jesus comes. He intercedes for the people and God says, put a bronze serpent on a stick and raise it up for the people and anybody who looks at it will be saved. The curse will be broken. And it happened. So Jesus takes that story a well-known story in his conversation with Nicodemus. I encourage you, if you've never run, read through the book of John, read through the book of John. It's, it gives you the story of the gospel through all time. The gospel stretches from Genesis to Revelation, and, and the book of John gives a, a great picture of it. And so Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the, the snake on a stick, so the Son of Man will be lifted up He's referring to his death on a cross. Jesus would be lifted up onto a cross and that all who would look at him, to look upon him would be to believe in him, to obey the words of God, to look and be saved, right? So there's a context to what Jesus is saying when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to be lifted up that all who would believe, they would look upon the savior, look at the cross. You see the cross over here? Did you know there's a cross in our building? It's right there. That all who would look at the cross would not just see it and go, oh, that's kind of a cool cross. They would look upon it and believe, look upon it with faith and receive the benefit of salvation promised to those who obey and believe. It was a sign It was a sign that brought healing. It it brought restoration. It brought salvation. So that in the story of Moses, the people wouldn't perish. And Jesus says the same thing, that all who would believe in me would not perish. See, that's the threat that all of humanity faces. Is separation from an eternal God. I've heard people ask me before, well, pastor, how could anybody, how could God send, a loving God send anybody to hell. But as C.S. Lewis puts it, God doesn't send anybody to hell. They send themselves. They live in the state of rebellion, having an opportunity to recognize Jesus and the one true God through all of creation, as Roman 1 said, and yet reject him. And so the threat is separation by our choice, by humanity's choice. And so... Here in this moment, there's an opportunity for humanity to respond. You see, God's response to the threat was not to let humanity uh, linger or to languish in this this inability to save themselves. No, God's response was grace. Knowing that humanity could not fix the problem they created. You see, every other religion poses the solution that if you work hard enough, right? If you reach nirvana, if you're able to do these things, then maybe the God or the gods would would have, have mercy on you. But God said, no, no, no. Humanity can't save themselves. I will do the work for them. Though they owe me, I will pay the debt. Though they owe because of the great cosmic rules, I will myself fix the problem. His response to the threat was to give the only thing that could fix the problem. God so loved the world that he gave. A sacrifice was needed. But God didn't just give something that was sitting around. Oh, I think I have something in the garage that might fix that. He gave of himself. He gave something that cost him something. Not a debt that he owed, but a debt that he paid at a great cost to himself. 
And here's how he goes about fixing the problem. I love what verse 17 says. God did not send his son to condemn the world. We forget that after verse 16 comes verse 17. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, he came to justify you and set you right, not to condemn you. His motivation was love. And his response was to give. Isn't that an amazing thing? For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. His response to the problem was to give, not to withdraw, not, not to condemn. Giving is response of God's heart to humanity's rebellion. Not judgment, but love. Not condemnation, but grace. Not death, but salvation. Not bondage, but freedom. And his response and his declaration then becomes an invitation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes. That's an invitation. Church, that's an invitation for you and for me to respond to God's great love demonstrated through grace and generosity. It's a powerful, powerful promise. I think that's why 90 million people Googled it when they saw it on TV as Tim Tebow was wearing it. It's because there's something powerfully drawing people to God, and it's his spirit. And so when they see a, a, a sign that says John 3, 16, I believe by the spirit of God they're being drawn to look it up. And then they read the scripture, God so loved the world that he gave that whoever, I love the, I love the word whoever. It's so wide open. Whoever means anybody, Amen. right? And whoever means everybody, Anybody who would respond, anybody who would acknowledge that they themselves are the rebel. We didn't just make mistakes. We acted in defiance. Do you get that? Sometimes I hear people describe sin as simply making a mistake or an error. No, that's right, Brian. (laughs) We didn't just make an error out of ignorance or, or, or lack of information. It's that within us lies a rebel who wants to do the opposite of what the king of all creation wants us to do, which is actually for our good. It's for our best. And we want to go do our own thing. And so in each of us lies a rebel. Who will save me from this wretched man that that I am, the scriptures say. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a powerful promise and it's a powerful invitation. Whoever believes, whoever believes. I love what Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17, the last part of it says, come. It's an invitation, come. And let him that is thirsty come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's a picture of Jesus who of himself said, I am the water of life. Come and drink freely from me. Whosoever means anyone, and it means everyone. And I think John 3, 16, again, reveals God's heart for the nation. His heart is global. Second Peter, one of, one of my favorite verses about what God wants for the world, when people say, well, what, what is God's will? Well, the one thing I know for sure, Second Peter uh, 3, 9 says, God's will, what he desires, is that none would perish, but all would come to repentance that none would perish. Everybody say none. None would perish. God doesn't want anybody to enter into eternity without him. He desires that all, everybody say all. All. A-L-L, all. All. Isn't that a detergent? All, A-L-L, okay, sorry. (laughs) That all would come to repentance. All would submit their desires and their way of doing things under the king of glory. Every nation. Our heart is global because God's heart is global. And the invitation that's been given to us is the invitation we should be extending to our neighbors and to every nation. And I believe that's best done together as a community through kingdom builders. 
Because not only is John 3.16 God's declaration and God's invitation, but it gives us a glimpse of God's mission. The mission of God is to rescue the whole world, all of humanity, the nations. Next week, I'm going to talk a little bit more about God's heart for the nations and how it's revealed through all of Scripture. But here's just a, a, a taste of what God's heart is for the nations. Psalm 67, starting in verse 2. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Right? This reveals God's heart, that he longs for every nation. Matthew 28, 19. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. The Greek word is martyrs. You will be martyrs in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That phrase, ends of the earth, you have to know the context that it's spread throughout all of scripture. Lest you think that Jesus shows up in the New Testament and suddenly God goes, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not the same guy I was in the Old Testament, I'm gonna do something new. He's, what he's doing is revealing his heart through all of scripture. Look at Isaiah 49.6. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This has always been God's heart. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world, to every nation, as a testimony to them. And then it says, and then the end will come. So we know we're actually part of God's mission before the end of time to reach every nation, Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude from every nation, tribe, people, ethnic group, and language. This is such a, a great vision of what will be accomplished through the work of God's church around the world. Is that at the end of time, every nation, every tribe, every tongue that has ever been or ever will be will be represented before the throne of God and the Lamb. Isn't that beautiful? It's going to be the best worship service ever because you're going to hear the languages of the world, right? It, will, it won't be one language. It won't be one people. It will be all representative from tribes, tongues, nations, ethnic groups from all of time standing before the throne and worshiping. It's such a beautiful beautiful thing. I think that's why we long. We long for peace in our world, and we long for uh, this idea of inclusivity, although sometimes we chase it in the wrong ways, is that the, actually the gospel is the way to bring people in, to bring them together, to overcome the barriers that have been raised up because of culture and politics and wars and all of the history. Only the gospel only the gospel of Jesus can overcome those things and bring people together. Look around the room. We are different. We look different. Some of you have hair. Some of us have less. <laughs> if we were to poll about different ways of thinking and upbringings and socioeconomics and this and that, we are all very different don't be fooled to think that diversity is only outward. But God, through the gospel and by his spirit, brings his people together like this, and we sit. And did you hear the voices in unison singing this morning? That's the unity that God desires. It's not under a party, but under the Prince of Peace. That's what God longs for. God's heart is global, and so our heart is global. So what is our response? What should our response be? Well, one, receive God's love. Receive God's love. I want to believe that every time we gather together, that there's someone who, for the very first time, will receive God's love. They'll step in to the space called faith and place their faith 
in the person of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. And through that, accept the new life that comes because of his resurrection. And maybe today is your day. Maybe today is your day to receive that love that God demonstrated to you. I love what Romans 5, 8 says. That this is how God demonstrated his love for us. That while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. That's a backwards way of doing things according to our world. If someone's nice to me, or someone loves me, then I will love them back. If someone first apologizes to me, then I might think about forgiving them. But we certainly don't hear it that someone would lay down their life for an enemy, maybe for a friend or a loved one, but certainly not someone that they hate or hates them. And yet the Bible says that's exactly what God did. What Jesus did for you and me was die before we ever chose him. He chose us. And that great love was demonstrated through the person of Jesus Christ. Receiving God's love, I think even those of you who are Christians, maybe for years, I think sometimes we, we struggle with receiving God's love. Because you look at yourself, you know your inner person, you know your past, you know the shame and the guilt that you live under. And you might be thinking to yourself, I don't deserve God's love. I'm not worthy of God's love. If I was a better person, if, if, I, didn't, if I didn't have this addiction, or if I, if I didn't go this direction, or if I, didn't, if I hadn't made these choices, if I didn't grow up in this family, if these things wouldn't have happened to me in my past, then, then, then I think God could love me, but, but he can't. But friend, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Look at your neighbor and tell them God loves you. Look at your other neighbor and says, and you too. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. Because if you're like me, sometimes you fall for the lie that somehow God doesn't love you. I oftentimes joke when people think like that, I want to say to them, you're not that special. You're not the, you cannot be the only one that God says, I love the whole world except for that one. The fact is, you are too special for God to look at you and say, no, I couldn't love you. There's no sin that's taken you too far. There's no depth that God's hand can't reach no height that he wouldn't climb up and rescue you. There's nowhere the Bible says height or depth where God's love cannot reach you and has not come. And you might feel like you're in the valley of the shadow of death, but the darkness is light to him and he sees you and he loves you and he's for you. He's not against you. And I believe there's people in this room this morning that need to receive that love. And maybe you've been walking with Jesus for years, but you, you just need to let it crack the shame that you've lived under, the deception, the hurt, the pain, whatever it is. Let God's love penetrate through that this morning. And maybe it's for the first time. Maybe this morning will be that first time you receive that love. And I believe you're feeling it in this moment. I believe you felt it when you walked in. I believe you felt it as we were worshiping. And as the voices of the people of God were lifted up, you were like, holy cow, something's different. Receive God's love. What's the other response today? Respond with God's love. Believer, we need to respond with God's love. To a hurting and dying world, we need to respond with God's love. I believe that's a proper response because God loved us. He gave us grace and he was generous with us. And so our response 
should reflect exactly how he treated us and what he gave us. He gave us grace and he was generous. And so I think the heart that is like God's will respond with the same grace and generosity and compassion. How can you not? Jesus' own words, freely you have received, so freely give. Give of the same Uh, grace and compassion that was given to you. I believe that the heart that has been touched by God can no longer stand idly by with salvation in their hands and an indifference in their heart. I believe that if you said yes to Jesus and you, you aren't brokenhearted about the things that are happening in our world, then you haven't really let Jesus touch you in, in the inner person that you've somehow grabbed onto, well, I, I believe the right doctrine, and so therefore I'm good to go. But when you stand before Jesus at the end of time, he's not going to ask you which theology you subscribe to, what doctrine you got right, or what church you belong to. What he will ask is, did you know him? Did you love him? And did you do his work? Were you on mission for him while you were here? The evidence of a heart truly changed desires that others would hear the gospel your neighbor and the nations Romans 10 14 says it this way how can they call on him whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in him of who in whom they've not heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching and how are they to preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news we are ascending church we are ascending church we are ascending church We believe in send, not only that we are sent out to our neighbors, but that we are sent to the nations and we send people around the world, whether it's on short-term missions trips or those who are called to full-time vocational ministry and missions around the world, we are ascending church. And we pray and we give and we go. We pray, we give, we go. We pray, we give, we go. We pray, we give, we go. We what? There we go. I love the way Charles Spurgeon said it. Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees imploring them to stay and not madly to destroy themselves. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Another said it this way, I don't want to build a home near the gates of heaven while I'm here on earth. I want to build a rescue station just in front of the gates of hell, that every person who must pass through them must do it with my hands wrapped around their ankles, pleading with them. Trust in Jesus. Kingdom builders is our response to God's generosity. God has been gracious and generous with us. How could we do no less? I believe generosity, as we're gonna talk a little bit more about that next week, is a reflection of how much you understand and what God has done in your life. When we give, we give so others can go. Nearly 50 ministries and missionaries depend on us monthly. And through Kingdom Builders, we faithfully support them. There's projects that are left undone. And church, I'm pleading with you as you pray about what your part will be in the miracle offering, we know and we believe that all those projects will be funded. We pray, we give, we go. I like to say it this way. We are that church. We are that church. We are that church, and we'll continue to strive to be that church that prays, that gives, and that goes. Let's join together tonight at 6 p.m., and we're going to pray for the nations, and we're going to pray for our nation, okay? Six o'clock tonight. 
You don't have anything going on. Clear your calendar. There's, there's not a football game that's important at that time. At 7 o'clock, there is. The Vikings play. But before that, <laughs> there are no important football games, okay? I will, I will pray through the Vikings game, too, for the Vikings. Um, but at six, let's join our hearts together because I believe in powerful moments like this that when we come together as a church and we pray for the nations, that God grants us that prayer, that he gives us the nations as an inheritance. That Jesus, it actually says that, the, the scriptures say that the nations are Jesus' inheritance and I believe he grants it to us. He gives us a piece of his inheritance. And I love that idea. So let's gather tonight to pray for the nations and to pray for our nation. I want you to grab a green envelope as you stand with me this morning. Maybe, maybe there's one, there's like one on every other seat, but maybe you'll stand together as a family. Uh, but just, if you can grab one, I just want you to hold it and stand, it, stand on up to your feet this morning as we pray. In two weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna ask everyone to be a part of the Kingdom Builders Miracle Offering. And I'm telling you, I'm super excited. I have a, I have a special friend who's gonna join us that morning. He was our, he's like, pasta. He has this awesome accent that I'm gonna butcher. He's like, you need to be prepared for what God's gonna do. And I was like, okay. And just listening to him, he's like, God's gonna do something amazing. Are you ready for it? I'm like, I don't know now. I'm, I thought I was. <laughs> I'm super excited. I've been praying. I hope you'll pray. I have actually put one of these on my, my refrigerator, you know, put it where you go the most. So I put it on the refrigerator. <laughs> and I see it, it's bright green. I see it, I see it every morning when I get my coffee creamer. And I, I want you to begin to pray about what your part is. We do this every year. I know some of you have already committed and you've been given faithfully. Some of you are going to just be inspired by what, by what God is telling you and you're gonna respond with a generous, maybe one time offering. But I believe that God is gonna use every one of us. And some of you are thinking, well, I don't have much and God does great things with little. So I'm telling you right now, if you're already calculating how little you can give, I think you need to, to reverse that and think how much God can do with what little you give. Because realize this, it doesn't matter if we give a, a dollar or a million dollars, it's all little to God. Think about that. It's all little to God. And so we gather our littles together and then we offer it to God and what does God do? Boom, miracle, right? So that's why I'm excited. And that's why I want you to begin to pray. Begin to pray, what is my part, God? What is my part? We'll talk a little bit more about it next week, but I believe God is gonna begin to inspire you. I believe for favor that maybe you've been in a financial uh, tough spot, but I believe as you begin to pray about your part, God is going to grant you favor and he's gonna enable you. Why? Because you're stepping into this place called faith. And when you step into faith, that's where God begins to operate in some pretty awesome ways, right? Every dollar you give, it goes to, to missionaries and ministries around the world. You should be excited about what God is going to do. Sunday, November 17th, miracle offering, right? Who, who wants to be part of a miracle, right? I think I ask that every year. Nobody's like, no, I don't wanna be part of a miracle. Oh, I'm out. Everybody wants to be part of a miracle. So let's, let's pray. And here's how I want to pray this morning. I want us to close our eyes and bow our heads. And the, uh, the first thing I'm going to pray is I'm going to invite, just like John 3.16 does, it's an invitation. I'm going to invite you, if you've never experienced, you've never placed your faith in Jesus, today's your day. Today's your day. That's the most important thing we'll do here this morning is invite you to place your faith in Jesus. Not only to receive forgiveness, but to receive new life. And then I'm gonna close in prayer by having us all lift our envelopes. We're just gonna, we're gonna dedicate them. We ded our, dedicate ourselves to the Lord and what he wants us to do. Let's do it. Every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're saying in this moment, Pastor Jeremy, either I've never prayed a prayer of faith to trust Jesus with my life, to receive his forgiveness and the new life that he provides. In just a minute, I'm gonna, in just a couple seconds, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand we're not gonna embarrass you, point you out. But what we are going to do is pray a prayer of faith with you, like so many in this room have already done. You're saying, Pastor Jeremy, I've never placed my faith in Jesus. I wanna experience that love today. Maybe for the first time, or maybe you're coming back. Maybe this is that moment for you. 
And when I count to three, with boldness and courage in your heart, you're gonna lift your hand and we're gonna pray with you. This is the safest place you'll ever be to make this step. One, I know that's you. Two, you know you felt it. Three, lift your hands up all over this room. Is that you this morning? Thank you. Anybody else? I'm looking across the room. Anybody else? Thank you, I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else? This might be the last time for you. Anybody else? All right, church, let's pray together that prayer that we pray nearly every week. Repeat out loud after me with those who've raised their hands. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for coming, demonstrating God's love to me by dying on a cross, by suffering in my place. I receive the forgiveness that comes through that. And I receive the new life that comes because of your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Now, church, would you lift up that envelope all around this room? If you're standing next to your spouse, with your family, just hold it together. Father, in the name of Jesus, would you inspire us by your word, by your love and generosity to us, Lord, we simply want to walk obedient to you with generosity so that your kingdom might go forth. Lord, we know that you don't need us, but you invite us in. In the way that you've limited yourself to the obedience of your people. But then through that, you multiply. You do miracles. You do amazing things. When we respond in faith, and would you author a new level of faith in each one of us, as we simply ask you, Lord, what is it that you want us to do to stretch us beyond what we think is possible to step into the impossible where you do your best work, where you do your best work. So find us faithful to do our best and to step out in faith. And Father, I thank you for the miracles that are already at work, that you've already started, that we don't even know about until we take that step of faith. So Father, grant us favor. Grant us faith in the name of Jesus, to the glory of the name of Jesus, for the building of his kingdom, I pray. And together we said as a church, amen and amen.